So if you're new to church or maybe you're not a Christian or maybe you're new to Northview and so you come from a different tradition or background or whatever your experiences may be, the conversation of baptism uh, can come with a diverse way of thinking and understanding. And so I think it's always appropriate for us as a church uh, to begin a baptism weekend by setting uh, the groundwork as to, hey, this is what we as a church believe and adhere to when it comes to baptism. And first and foremost, uh, we believe that baptism is a public proclamation of an inner transformation. It's essentially going public in your faith. We would say that baptism is the wedding ring of the Christian faith. It is standing publicly in front of your family, your friends, your peers, even strangers, saying, hey, just so everyone knows, I'm with Christ, I'm with Jesus. It is a public proclamation of an inner transformation. And with that said, it's important to understand that baptism is for your association, not for your assurance. And depending on your tradition, you may have different thoughts on this. And I would just encourage you to go to the pages of Scripture and really take into consideration how this is played out in Scripture. What happens is, is when you assume baptism is for your assurance, meaning you have to be baptized to be saved, you're going to bump into things in Scripture that are going to cause a little bit of confusion. For example, Jesus on the cross tells the thief, today you will be with me in paradise, you will be saved. And what you don't see is the thief coming down from the cross to be baptized. And so you'll wonder, did Jesus lie to the thief or is he actually saved? And I think when you understand that it's for your assurance and not your, uh, sorry, for your association and not your assurance, uh, what that does is it kind of dismisses some of the superstition that we can attach to our faith. Baptism is not superstitious. It is symbolic. It is a representation of the, the death and the resurrection of Christ that we now identify with. So furthermore, I would say baptism is not a bath. It's a burial. And I think sometimes that's important to note because this is not individuals saying, hey, I had a wild week. I'm gonna get in the tub and rinse it off and maybe next weekend I'll go sideways again and I'll get in the tub and rinse it off. A bath is something you do regularly or at least we would pray you would do this regularly. <laughs> personal hygiene is not just personal. It affects all of us. And a burial is different. It's saying, hey, I am laying to rest the old me apart from Christ and I am stepping into this new life with Christ. And for those of us who have embraced a relationship with Christ, every single one of us has discovered, oh my goodness, life with Christ, it's just so much better. It's more fulfilling, it's more rewarding. It comes with greater clarity, greater strength and confidence. And, and there's a peace that surpasses understanding and a joy uh, that is supernatural. It doesn't mean that life is perfect and life is always easy, but it is better, and it is leading us to a place of eternal destination that every single one of us is going to just cherish. And that is ultimately what baptism is. It's saying, hey, I identify uh, with the death and the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ, and this is my new life as a follower of Christ. And before we get into baptisms today, I, I do have to bend your ear on a couple things because we have been in a series called For the Love of God. And I've really enjoyed teaching this series and, and there's some things that I, I think are important for us to uh, tag on to the end as we close out this series. In this message uh, or collection of talks, we've been kind of redeeming the statement for the love of God, the statement that we often make out of frustration. Someone cuts you off in traffic and you're like, oh, for the love of God, who gave that idiot a driver's license, right? It's a statement of frustration for us. And we're like, well, what if we were to redeem that and rather it being a statement of frustration, it becomes a statement of fascination. Like, oh my goodness, for the love of God, he is so good and merciful and he is so unwavering in his attentiveness and faithfulness to my life and he is powerful and mighty, yet he is gentle and good. It's all the things in which make up God and it's for the love of God that we uh, take our cues and our marching orders. And in this series, we've been establishing that first and foremost, God is love and God has existed uh, from the very beginning. That God is love, the source of perfect and complete love. And it is from this source of love that you and I have our being, which is really important to understand that God's love comes first. That love is not a response, it's a reality. 
that you and I live from perfect love, that God loves us not because of who we are, but because of who he is. It's a remarkable idea. And it's living every single day with confidence and freedom and joy and peace, knowing that there's nothing you can do to earn more of God's love, and there's nothing you could ever do to lose any of God's love. He loves you fully, completely, and at all times. Is that not an encouragement? And God is so faithful to his children. And so what you find is we live from this posture of God is for us, and we live for the love of God, not in terms of performance or earning, but we now live marked by this grace. And those of us who have had an experience with this grace now live daily as an expression of this grace on mission uh, to accomplish God's redemptive work in the world. And I think it's when you fully understand or at least try to lean into the depths of God's love that you discover how overwhelming and life-altering it is. And there's two statements that I repeat, and I think it's, it's worth jotting down, journaling about, thinking about, talking with your small group. And the first is this. The one who knows you the best loves you the most. Now think about that. God knows everything about you, every mistake you've ever made, every toxic, dysfunctional thought or emotion you've ever had. He knows everything about you. And I know that thought makes you nervous because here's the deal. If anyone else in your life had that type of information, what would they do? They would run. If anyone had that type of information on me, they would run. But the one who knows you the best, who knows everything about you, he loves you the most. That's remarkable. And in addition to that, God loves all of us, every single one of us, as if there was only one of us. As if we were the only person on this speck of dust in this galaxy, God has tailored fit his love and his grace and his goodness to our life, and he has the capacity to love all of us so well, it's as if we're the only one in existence. That's amazing. And it's learning to live rooted in that love, strengthened in that love, equipped by that love. And I don't think you can talk about the love of God and not open up the book of Romans. Now, if you're new to the Bible, you should know and you owe it to yourself to do your own research. The Bible is the most impressive a collection of ancient literature in, in the world. And even atheists would agree with this. There is not a collection of ancient documents that can rival the Bible. It is a book, uh, a library of 66 books comprised by over 40 authors for, in three different languages on three different continents over centuries on end. It's a pretty impressive work. And most commentators and scholars, and I would put myself in this category, would say the most impressive book of the Bible, the, the Mount Everest of it all, is the book of Romans. You know, Paul was so unyielding in his devotion to advance the cause of Christ and to tell anyone and everyone about the goodness of who Jesus is and the reality of what has been extended to us because of the finished work of the cross. And Paul just audaciously uh, goes on mission to Rome, which was the epicenter of the known world. And it was the influential place in which the Stoics and the philosophers uh, kind of marked you know, humanity. And at the same time, there's all these false idols and a lot of different things happening in culture. And Paul shows up in a space like that and he begins to defend and champion and, and proclaim the gospel in that space. And it's really remarkable. And in Romans chapter one, uh, Paul says something that I think is great. In fact, I think if every Christian thought like this, uh, we would turn the world upside down. Romans chapter one, verse 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And that's what I love about Baptism Week. And it is individuals saying, hey, I'm not embarrassed to be a Christian. This Jesus was humiliated and executed publicly on my behalf. And if he was willing to do that for me, who am I to not stand and rise and live for him? And it is just learning to say, I'm not embarrassed and I don't have to be timid or waffling in my faith. I am proud to be a follower of Christ. And so Paul, he, he steps into this space and he would write the most eloquent, and well-articulated defense and explanation of the gospel known as the book of Romans. 
And obviously, we don't have time to go through it all today. I think you could do an entire two-year series, verse by verse, on the book of Romans, which may be something we need to pray about as a church. And it builds as he, you know, kind of develops his argument. And what you find is one commentator said, if you think of the wedding ring metaphor again, and you think of the Bible as a wedding ring, he said, if the Bible is a wedding ring, there's no question the book of Romans is the diamond. And he goes on to say, and if the book of Romans is the diamond, chapter eight is the sparkle. It's the thing that gets your attention. And as you read through the book of Romans, there are so many like mic drop moments, hallmark statements where you're like, oh my goodness, that statement, that's in the book of Romans. And if you have your Bible, open up to Romans chapter eight. And I mean, this is the type of stuff that I feel like needs like instrumentals behind it. And it should have more exclamation marks in the text. And I just feel like someone with a better voice should read this because I just think it's so good. But verse one reads like this. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, they set their minds on the spirit. And there's a lot to be said here, and, and know this, uh, we don't have time today to belabor chapter eight. Uh, but I would say there are three mega themes that you might want to look into. Uh, the first is the believer security. And there's two statements there, and I need you to say them to your neighbor. Say it with some enthusiasm. And the first word is now. Look at your neighbor and say now. And now look at your other neighbor, your second choice, and say no. Yeah, now and no. And this is really critical. He says, okay, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And he is beginning to establish the security we have in Jesus Christ. And I find that I'm in conversations often with believers who are walking around with an unnecessary insecurity in their faith. And it's like, you don't have to be so doubtful. What Jesus did on the cross sealed the deal. And you don't have to live in fear as if, you know, your eternity hangs in the balance every single day of your life. And the word now refers to the current time. Paul's saying, hey, there is now currently at this very moment, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So now refers to the current time. Now hear this, and this is going to be maybe uncomfortable for some, insightful for others, encouraging for some of you as well. And that is this. As your pastor, my job is to simply teach what the Bible teaches, and as believers, uh, for us to understand what we adhere to, and as non-believers, this may be something you want to think about and consider. What he is saying is, now there's no condemnation at the current moment. Essentially, what Paul is saying is every single one of us has a judgment day in our story. There will be a judgment day for every single one of us. I, I know that's nerve wracking. And what he is saying is for the believer, the judgment day is now behind them. But for the non-believer, the judgment day still stands before them. Does that make sense? If you are in Christ, there is now no condemnation. That's a thing of the past. Jesus settled it on the cross. Uh, another way of saying it is if you are a Christian, life as you know it is as close to hell as you'll ever be. But if you're not a Christian, life as you know it is as close to heaven as you will ever be. And so what Paul is saying, he's like, hey, for those who are in Christ, there is now, currently, at this very present moment, no condemnation because those who have surrendered their life to Christ, their judgment day is behind them. Does that make sense? So this idea of eternal security is something that most Christians uh, should have a greater confidence in. 
And he then says, now, what was the second word? No. So now refers to current time. No refers to all time. And he's saying, there is now currently and moving forward eternally no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is amazing. And it calls to mind for me John chapter 8. Jesus is teaching. And once again, these Pharisees, self-righteous, religious elite individuals are trying to catch Jesus in air. And so they go and they find a woman who is also in air. And they catch a woman who is caught in adultery and they drag the poor woman out into public and they throw her before Jesus and it's completely humiliating. And they say to Jesus, hey, the law says an individual guilty of her situation should be stoned. And Jesus so brilliantly says, okay, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. And what happens is, is this woman is downcast with her head to the ground, awaiting her destruction, and all she begins to hear is rocks dropping. And people begin to drop their rocks, and people begin to walk away. And eventually, it is just her and Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, where are your accusers? Has anyone condemned you? And she says, no, and Jesus makes a statement. He says, yeah, neither do I condemn you. Well, folks, here's what you have to understand. When Jesus makes this statement, hey, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, everyone dropped the rocks because they had sin in their life. But here's what's so mesmerizing. That day, there was someone in the crowd who was without sin, who had the right to throw a stone. And who was that person? Jesus. And Jesus stands in front of the woman with the right to do so. And he's makes it very clear to her and anyone else who would lean into the passage, I am not about this. I'm not in the business of condemning. What you have to understand is God doesn't send people to hell. We booked our own ticket. God saves people for heaven. It's a massive distinction in how you understand God's activity in the world. And he's saying there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So your eternal security is a mega theme of chapter eight. The, the second mega theme would be sanctification. And the question I think most people when they bump into church is like, okay, how can this Jesus really change an individual's life? Have you ever wondered that? Like, how does he actually do it? How does he transform me from the inside out? And this is where Paul begins to draw our attention to your mindset. He says, those who live by the flesh have their mind set on things of the flesh. And those who live according to the spirit have their mind set on things of the spirit. Does that make sense? There's another hallmark verse in Romans that says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. And, and so what Paul is getting our attention to gravitate to is, folks, what comes into your mind will come out through your life. And it's understanding it's important to think critically. And the Holy Spirit's role in it all is essential. Now, what you're gonna find, and I would, again, say you owe it to yourself, go home, open up your own Bible, dive into it with a group of people, have a discussion. Romans chapter seven is comical. Paul is illustrating how we are all deficient and unable to uh, fulfill the, the righteous requirement of the law. And so all throughout Romans seven, he's making I statements. In fact, he makes the statement I 26 times in my translation of the Bible. And then he comes to chapter eight and he makes the statement about the spirit 19 times. And so there's this contrast of this is life by yourself and this is life with God, Romans 7 and Romans chapter 8. And what you find is there is a significant chasm of a gap between a morally restrained mind and a supernaturally changed mind. I think every single one of us can exhaust our personal faculties and we can leverage all the willpower we have to try to manufacture our own righteousness and exhaust our willpower to morally restrain ourselves. But what we're gonna find is we're too limited. We're all gonna come up short. We can't get the job done. And what Paul is saying is there's a big difference between a morally restrained mind and a supernaturally changed mind. Mind. Another way of saying it is there's a big difference between being emotionally driven and spiritually led. And he's saying when you understand the role of the Holy Spirit in your life, 
you start to change from the inside out. And this uh, would be where we understand sanctification. And this is going to be something that could get misinterpreted, so, so lean in. I think most people in your journey with Christ, they have to go through two conversions. Now, what I mean by that is you don't have to be saved twice to go to heaven. Uh, conversion and salvation are not completely synonymous. I think when you are first saved, salvation, that first conversion is when you discover God's love for you. You discover, oh my goodness, like I cannot believe how much God loves me, that's salvation. Well, then eventually over time, you get beyond yourself and you discover God's love for the world. That's why Paul was so marked by grace. He was like, I have to go to Rome because God loves the world. And it's his almost second conversion. Like this is changing the way I think and it's changing me from the inside out. This would be the difference between salvation and sanctification, which if you're new to North, you just know I go in deep every single week, right? Like I'm gonna lean in on some deep theology. But here's the thing. What you have to understand is salvation gets you to heaven. Sanctification gets heaven through you. And over time, you become an embodiment of the Spirit of God who is a representation of Christ within the world, heaven on earth. It's, it's quite amazing. And Paul's drawn our, our understanding there. And he then, the third mega theme would be the Holy Spirit's ministry to the believer. And in this, you bump into the doctrine of justification, which for awareness for me would be without a doubt in my top 10 theological doctrines. This is a big one. And I, and I know some of you, you have kids in the room, you're like, oh my goodness, like, let us come up for air. I have children here. We need to keep them engaged. If I were talking to my kids, this is how I would explain it. To be justified means when you are in Christ, you are justified. So now when God looks at you, he doesn't see you, he sees Christ. So when God looks at you, he sees you or he sees me just as if I'd never sinned justified, just as if I'd never sinned, because we are now in Christ. And what you find when you go through the writings of Paul is the word or the statement in Christ is Paul's favorite statement. In Paul's writings, all throughout scripture, Paul makes the statement in Christ 165 times. It's a big statement that you and I are in Christ that when God looks upon you and he looks upon me, he sees Jesus. That is pretty remarkable. And Paul is building this idea of, hey, there is no condemnation. You don't have to go through life insecure in your faith, and you can be marked and moved by this love that God has for you. And then he comes to the end of the passage. And he says in verse 31, after he talks about, hey, God loves you, God is doing remarkable things in you, but you still live in a broken, faulty world. You're still gonna go through pain, you're still gonna endure confusion, you're gonna still have inconvenience and suffering at times. Well, what do we make of those things? When we bump into trials, do we assume God no longer loves us? Is that indicative of him throwing in the towel on you and I? And Paul's like, no, that's, that's a misinterpretation. He says, well, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Paul is not endorsing some bizarre form of entitlement here. He's just saying, God gave up the ultimate treasure, his one and only son. And if he's willing to do that for us, who's to say what else he would do on behalf of his kids. He said, who shall bring charge against God's elect? If it is God who justifies, who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. So the good news is Jesus is praying for you. The bad news is Jesus is praying for you. That life is tough, and you and I are gonna face some hardships, but we have a Christ who has gone before us, who is working on behalf of us every single moment of every single day. He intercedes for you and I. Now, watch this question. 
He says, who shall separate us from the love of God? Someone say, who? Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Paul is belaboring the point. He says, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. In other words, what he's saying is if you are a follower of Christ in this faulty world, you will face adversity. You will come across obstacles and opposition. He says, no, in all these things, oh my goodness, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I mean, that's a mic drop statement. I'm just gonna come out here one week and just read that and literally drop everything and walk off. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Again, we live from his love and for his love. For I am sure, Paul's saying, folks, I'm confident. I am convinced. I am unwavering and unapologetic in this opinion. I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demonic rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And can I get an amen? I mean, that is quite the verse. And, and here's what Paul does. Paul shows up in a context and he realizes, oh, people put limitations on God's love. And he starts to recognize all these boundaries that people are putting on the love of God and they're restraining God's heart. And so what he starts doing is he starts pushing back the boundaries. He literally takes a spectrum and he pushes it as far as he can, the good and the bad, neither angels nor demons, neither life nor death, neither depth or height, neither the past or the future, he is stretching the boundaries. And I get the feeling God is claustrophobic in some of the boxes you choose to place him in. His love for you is overwhelming. It's so expansive. It's wow, his love is so grand. And I want you to pay attention to the question I had you repeat. Who? It almost seems as if Paul goes on to answer what? What could separate us from God? And he said, no, the, the bigger question is who can separate us from God? Because in your mind, in your life, who's the number one person trying to convince you that you're separated from God's love? You. Don't we all think there's a loophole and we don't fit? Don't we all think, ah, I don't know, like, Paul, you just went down a list and you rattled off all these things, but there's a situation in my life that you didn't mention. Oh, that love doesn't apply to me which is what makes Paul so brilliant. Look what he says. If you go back to the text, he says, verse 39, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. Paul gets to making a list and he realizes this could go on forever. I'm going to make a statement that eradicates any loophole that anyone would try to put on the love of God. Folks, anything else in all of creation, nothing, can separate you. Nothing severs God's heart for you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. It's outstanding. And the book ends of chapter eight is it begins with condemnation and it ends with separation. And what Paul is saying is, guys, you still are placing limits on how much God loves you you're still placing limits on God's love for the world. And what would happen if you opened your heart and you opened your mind to the reality that this God's love for you is incomprehensible, it's overwhelming, it's life altering, and you don't have to hold on to your shame because God's not holding out on his grace. The moment you give your life to Christ, he dumps a truckload of grace on you. And you wake up the next day and he dumps a truckload of grace on you. And you wake up the next day and he dumps a truckload of grace on you. And eventually you just get exhausted by his grace and you throw in the towel because you recognize my sin is no match for God's grace. 
His love is overwhelming. His grace is sufficient. And nothing in all of creation could ever separate me from the love of God. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's why we celebrate, and that's why we live boldly, and that's why we try to aim to say the things, same things Paul said. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I have only been radically changed by the gospel. Amen. And so at this moment, would you stand to your feet as we begin to transition into baptism? Again, this ought to be a celebration. If you uh, don't want to make noise with your mouth by singing, clapping, shouting, do something. Stomp. Make some noise. Let them know we love them. But um, we're so proud of everyone at all of our campuses. And let's just pray over this moment. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the finished work of the cross. God, it is the cross that marks our life. And God, thank you for your ability to change us from the inside out. And thank you for your resolve and commitment and devotion to your children. Thank you for eradicating sin in our life and doing away with the condemnation that was once our reality. And thank you for the security that we have. And God, thank you for your grace that has been bestowed upon our lives. God, in this moment, we just, we celebrate all that you're doing in the lives of individuals in our church. And God, we're just so thankful that you are in the business of transforming people. And we give you thanks. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.